So I'd like to uh, speak this morning from um, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. This is study 20. As we sought to go through this first chapter, I'd like to uh, speak on the unfolding drama of redemption. Now, that's not an original title. I have a book somewhere in the house that is called that. But I like the, the title so much I pinched it. So if I ever meet the author, I'll thank him one day. But for now, um, that's, my, that's my message. That's my subject, the unfolding drama of redemption. Now, there's, a, there's some words here that I know we've got the blessing of having um, people here, who've, uh, youngsters here who've made a profession of faith only recently. And redemption is not exactly a word that you hear too often. So I'd like to kind of define that. I, I have a bad habit um, of, of just assuming everyone knows uh, theological words because I've always known them all my life. But of course this world has um, left behind um, some of the, the things that um, the blessings of the Word of God and haven't any time for them any longer. So just before we come to this, uh, this great subject of redemption that I'm basing on verses 18 and 19 of First Peter, but we'll finish off with the passage that the lady uh, was reading whilst uh, that, that chap was, was, was using his artistic skills. Um, so that's in Exodus 12. We'll come to that towards the end of this message. But um, I want to first of all just try to give you a definition of redemption and then please forgive me it's not easy to describe these things and my illustration initially is perhaps very poor but it's so I can get the message across to you of, uh, of, of redemption I, um, I uh, do a lot of driving and because of that I'm in petrol stations all the while and every petrol station offers you a, a deal a, a card to get your points on. Um, now, believe it or not, I have a, a Morrison's card. I have a, what else do I have here? I have a, a Shell card. Oh, I'm just warming up. I have a Nectar card. So every, every, every time I go in, they ask me, do you have this card? I say, oh, well, I'll have one, you know. And, and now I always get points put onto these cards whenever I go into petrol station and these points eventually can be redeemed for a gift now I've actually got apps on this phone uh, I've got a shell app um, incredibly technology these days it never ceases to amaze me uh, the, the card gets swiped at the petrol station then it appears on my app and then it tells me what I can afford with the points that I have what I can have as a gift and um, Morrison's do a, a five pound cash voucher. Uh, other, other companies do other things. You get the points on the card and eventually you can purchase something. You can get a gift and, and you can redeem those points for something that you would like if you have enough of them. And this whole principle of redemption um, as seen in a, in a very menial, very day-to-day -day example there, but in a much higher, more glorious and divine way, Jesus actually used himself to redeem for us the gift of salvation. Do you understand a little bit better now? The, the principle, the idea of redemption and the lovely... Uh, idea of redemption is that Jesus I use my points on the card Jesus used himself and in particular he used his blood to purchase my salvation to redeem me to take away the curse of sin in my life and this is a wonderful thought redemption is such a powerful thought. Let me give you this thought as well, because I'm a great appreciator of creation, great appreciator of it. 
uh, William and Caroline were in a lovely place uh, down in Dumfries and you go to some places and you're just amazed oh lord my god when I in awesome wonder think of that beautiful day we had at Luss or the last two years the beautiful days that we've had at Luss and you have that beautiful lock and you have the the mountains in the background and the extraordinary um scene it's just it just it just fills your heart with joy and amazement and wonder but here's a here's a here's a truth God created all that with his son's word Jesus the word God said it let there be light and there was light so that's good isn't it that's wonderful but see redemption God purchased that not with the word of his son but with the blood of his son have we any idea this morning how much greater redemption is than creation because it cost so much more God brought this world into being through his word through the through the, the Lord Jesus Christ he became manifest didn't he the word became flesh but it says quite plainly in John 1 that the word created all things and elsewhere it says he upholds all things by the word of his power but how much costlier was was redemption for God to bring that to sinners and the more something costs you know I've got some lovely pictures I've got one in particular Bethany gave me and I always kept it because it's um it says this my dad is cool now I know I'm not cool but your children are wonderful aren't they they actually think you are cool I'm the most uncool person out but for that moment she probably regrets drawing that picture now when she was two and a half but for that moment she thought I was cool so I've kept that one it's very precious to me but you know something if I, if I put that up to Christie's the auctioneer people it wouldn't go for much and if it was placed alongside the Mona Lisa uh, I'm afraid I, I would be left far far behind because something is only uh, valuable according to how much people are prepared to pay for it the more you pay for something the more valuable that must be the more costly that must be the more worthwhile that must be and the same goes but in a much higher and beautiful and infinite way with what God did with redemption so if you love the hills like I do if you love the 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 green expanses and the the awesome oceans and the and the amazing uh, snow-capped uh, hills and 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 you just as you go off in a plane and you look down below and you see all of creation laid out like a vast carpet and you worship God or oh, spare this reserve this in your heart how much greater than all of this put together was redemption because of how much it cost Almighty God to purchase our salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ God's Son so those two thoughts just to try and give you an inkling uh, of this business of redemption and the unfolding drama of it it is dramatic it is dramatic it's breathtaking it's astonishing what God has done now I'm never going to be able to cover all of this it's going to take me two or three weeks to to look into this business of redemption um, but here's my first attempt at scratching the surface of it I'm going to try and use the the first three letters of redemption hopefully we'll get through all the letters eventually but the first three and it's a good three letters R-E-D red that's wonderful because red is the color of blood and no doubt that was the color I know there's some Ranger supporters say that their their blood's blue but I don't believe them some Celtic supporters say their blood's green no I'm afraid everyone's blood is red and even the blood of Jesus would have been crimson red so it's a lovely example straight away the first three uh, letters of redemption R E and D and I want to show you initially what we have been saved from what we've been redeemed from 
And this is so important. There's other aspects of redemption that we'll come to, but we'll start off with this and we'll use these first three letters to do this. What we have been redeemed from. And the first letter R is rebellion. If you're a Christian this morning, you have been saved from rebellion. Rebellion against God. God has redeemed you from that attitude, from that, that rebellion that's in your heart. Now, it's a subject that's very close to my heart. I remember, I remember going for a walk with a very godly man, lovely, lovely man, my father-in-law. We were walking um, in the hills of uh, Killern uh, together, and we were just talking about um, Christian things. And, and, I, and I says to him, I have a confession to make, Pastor. I says, I'm a bit of a rebel. Uh, and uh, he said to me, he said to me, it was a lovely answer. It really broke me, actually, the answer. He says, David, do you want to know something? So am I. And you know what really hit me as we began to talk there and then? That God can take a rebellious streak in you that can consign you to hellfire and damnation, by the way. But God can take that and use it by channeling it to the glory of God. So that no longer are you rebelling against God, but you're rebelling uh, in a much more beautiful and pure way and lovely way against this world. It's not um, a rebellion that causes civil disruption, but you just don't have any time for this, and you're not bothered about what this world stands up for and, and what this world what this world believes, because you know it's all it's all um, meaningless and, and 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 is and is hopeless. We were talking earlier on. This is all fits into this beautiful spiritual jigsaw that Peter has given us. We were talking earlier on about have you a hopeless end or an endless hope and a hopeless end is a nightmare and that's what this world stands up for I just my heart went out to that situation i woke up to on i think it was tuesday morning and then i was um the, with regards to robin williams and the sadness of that situation dreadful my, my title of my sermon on uh, tuesday was robin robbed of hope and that's how i feel uh, about this world that's how i see this world and i see it all the while it just frustrates the living daylights out of you you think to yourself how um it, it can people just commit everything uh, to this world when it's just like a purse with holes in it it doesn't hold any hope for the future and you can try to prove me wrong millions have not necessarily me but the scriptures have tried to prove the scriptures are wrong but you know the conclusion i've come to and it's all by the grace of god none but christ can satisfy none other name for me there's love there's light there's lasting joy that the lord jesus has found for me and this is this is a, a wonderful conclusion what a beautiful conclusion i've come to that that god has saved me and redeem me from rebellion which in the scriptures says is as a sin of witchcraft that rebellion against God and now God's given me uh, he's taken that that trait he's sanctified it and now I'm rebelling against Satan that's a good rebellion isn't it I'm rebelling against the kingdom of Satan I'm rebelling against all he stands for I'm a I'm a glory rebel if you like against the things of this world that are taking people to hellfire to damnation and all this is my great desire is to thank god this morning he saved me from rebellion listen to these verses you get this actually in the passage first peter 1 listen to verse 14 as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance as obedient what's the opposite of rebellion obedience so here peter's saying as obedient children you're not rebellious anymore 
God's given you the power to obey. This is all about power. This is all about the power of love and the power of God's grace in your life. So now you were once a rebel, but now you're an obedient child. You're fashioning yourself not according to the former lusts and your ignorance. Now you are holy in all manner of conversation. And this is powerful reasoning I'm going to give you. Very powerful reasoning indeed. There's a text in Proverbs 23 that says this. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now there's another word, perhaps some of you aren't familiar with, lust. What is lust? Lust is great and overwhelming desire. And again, it's something that can be used for the glory of God. You can have a great and an overwhelming desire for God's glory. Jesus actually says, with desire, I have desired to be with you. To celebrate this supper, uh, this remembrance of my coming um, death upon the cross. Jesus had a great desire within his, his heart. With desire have I desired. But so often this world is all caught up with the lusts of the flesh of this realm of here, of now. And this, this is what happens. Do you think, to use a very extreme example, do you think these jihadists that have gone to Iraq and are chopping people in two and killing women and children, do you think they just woke up one morning like that? Did it just happen? Did they just wake up and think, right, I'm going to be a um, a jihadist psychopath and I'm going to pack my bags and get off to Syria. No, 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 no. These things started in the heart a long time before that terrible day where it became action. It, be it manifested itself. And this is where it all begins, in the heart, in the imagination. Now this is all secret. Very secret indeed. I don't know what you're thinking right now. You might be bored to tears with me. You might be saying, David, shut up. I've got a nice McDonald's lined up for my lunch. Will you please, will you please get this over with quickly? You might on the other hand be saying, oh, David, this is, this is just what I want to hear. This is my heart that you're speaking to. You, I feel you, 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 you're preaching the word and it's just for me. And it's building me up in my most holy faith. I don't know. God can give the ability, incredibly, to some preachers and to some brothers and sisters in Christ to actually read people's minds. That must be a scary thing to do. Wow. So that they actually uh, can tell um, because God's telling them. They can actually tell what's going through a person's mind. The situations in the scriptures where Jesus had that gift. He knew what people were going to say before they said it. And then he answered the question that they're not, not actually said. But they realized, goodness me, I was just about to ask that question and you've, you've beat me to it, uh, Jesus. But, you know, this morning, I'll be quite honest with you, I can't read any of your minds. I'll let you know if something comes to me and, 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 yeah, and, and suddenly God gives me a revelation. That would be quite frightening though for me and for you, I think. But um, you could be thinking, you're here in body, but you're not here in spirit. You, you just want to be away from here. You could, on the other hand, be thinking, oh, we should preach longer, David. I can't get enough of this. I just think this is wonderful what you're saying to me. And, and it's all in the heart. It's all in the thoughts that God only knows. We're talking about this fear of God last Lord's Day morning. God knows our, our thoughts. And our thoughts then... Uh, form into words and then our words become deeds but it starts there it starts in between these ears and in the heart of the man in the mind it all begins it all takes shape now you can't stop temptation you can't stop tempt it's not a sin to be tempted don't think for a moment because you, you felt like killing someone all of a sudden because of something they did that that necessarily is a sin it's what you do after that as to whether it's a sin or not it's whether you pick up that baseball bat and you give them a, a, a good hard slap across the, the lug with it no it's, it's the initial thought and the initial temptation unless of course you're inviting it unless of course you're you know you can hardly 
say, oh, I wish these prostitutes would stop tempting me when you're in a red light district walking by them all, you know. You, you, you are leaders not into, the, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So you've got to do yourself some good, but there are some temptations that suddenly come upon you. And then there's this moment in time where one or two things are going to happen. For the worldling, invariably, um, they will find it very difficult to resist temptation. And for the worldling, uh, for the person who's unconverted, they don't have any principles, they don't have any character with regards to what's right and what's wrong. As far as they're concerned, if it feels good, do it. That's the principle they go by. But for the Christian, he has power. He has power. He has influence. He has the Spirit of Christ in his life. And he can refute the temptation. He can put pay to it. He can turn his eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth then grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You have this tremendous opportunity as a Christian through reading God's word, through meditating in it day and night, through, through thinking upon pure things, lovely things, to have power to overcome. So you have this, this, um, this uh, tremendous sacrifice of Jesus, this redemption, and it can give you power. Now, Christians fall into two categories. They're either not using the power that God's given them, so that's, that's sometimes what happens. Or they, they, they've just made a profession and they don't have the power at all. All they have is an empty profession. They've just said they're Christians. And, and the fact is, the reason they keep falling into temptation is because the Holy Spirit's never made a change in their hearts. They've not got the root of the matter in them. Christians, fall, Christians who are ineffective and, and are defeated continually fall into one of those two categories. Either they're professing, so they're not really Christians, or they are Christians but they're not utilising what God has, has given them in the tremendous power of the Holy Spirit, in redemption, and what Jesus' blood has purchased. You know, Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians I think it's 2 Corinthians 10. Let me give you it because it's a wonderful text along these, along, these, along these lines. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. This is for 2 Corinthians 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What a wonderful stage of sanctification to get to, where every thought is brought into obedience unto Christ. Wow! So not only is that person acting according to the Word of God, speaking according to the Word of God, you delve, if you could, into the very recesses of their mind, of their imaginations, of their fantasies even. You delve into these even, and what do you discover? Every imagination, every thought has been brought into the... You say, that can't be done, surely. Oh yes, it can. I'm not telling you, you you'll never have a bad thought from now onwards. Spurgeon was walking along um, a riverside once, trying to meditate on the things of God, and suddenly this blasphemous, diabolical thought came into his mind, which he had to dismiss. C. H. Spurgeon was a, a great, probably the greatest Baptist preacher of, of the of the Baptist tradition, and is as world renowned. And suddenly, out of the blue, I mean, I, some people were surprised when I said that. Uh, that um, when I was counting a banking and it was a hundred pounds over, the thought crossed my mind, I could take this money. No one would know. The cameras are pointing away from me. The customers are away, they trust me. I have a hundred pounds here, I could have all to myself. So people say, do you honestly think that way? Well, yes, <laughs> I'm human. I'm human. What stops me? Redemption. Redemption. Because Jesus' blood has bought for me a power 
over sin that stops me from doing. And if I, if I do sin, it's because I've neglected redemption. I've neglected what Jesus' blood has bought for me. I've said, no, I'd, I'd rather do this my way. Be a bit of Frank Sinatra, you know. I'll do it my way. And of course, what happens? You fall flat on your face. You make a right monkey of yourself. And you, and you, and you lose all credibility before God. And then you, you just you say, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Why did I do it my way? Why don't I just do it God's way? With the power that God's given me through his redemption. Through his blood shed for me. We sing it, and, and I promise you it's true. There's power. Power. Wonder-working power. Not just to wipe away your sins, that's wonderful. To cover your sins and to remove them as far as the east is from the west. But also to give you power over sin in your daily life life to give you power over rebellion god has given you this power over disobedience power over even your imaginations over your fantasies now it might seem extraordinary but this i heard it myself I heard it myself um great theologian and preacher john MacArthur was approached by a member of his congregation and he says listen I don't know what I'm gonna do I'm I'm um, I mean I'm really struggling with lust with sexual lust I'm really struggling with it I can't get away from it it's dogging my every step and it's distracting me left right and center I just feel it's overcoming me so MacArthur John MacArthur says to him tell me honest answer please do you read pornography and the man, colour drained from his face, said, yes, I do. MacArthur says, well, you're feeding the monster. You see? You feed the monster, and the monster will start not just being your thoughts. It will eventually emerge from the shadows of your mind, and it will start to formulate your very speech, and then start to affect your actions. Do you think a rapist just wakes up one morning and rapes someone? No, it starts a long time before that, as a man thinks in his heart. Now the trouble is today, of course, the, 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 the accessibility and the affordability and the availability of pornography, for instance, it's rife, it's everywhere. With a touch of a button, there's, there's no sweat, there's no cost hardly, there's no um, shame to it, much of it is anonymous, and it's, it's, a, it's a despicable situation that we find ourselves in, that I hear, I find this extraordinary, but 60% of the internet is used for that reason. That seems extraordinary, but that's the way we've got to, because, because if you're just unconverted and you don't have this power, power of redemption in your life, Oh, you had it. You're just going to go along with the course of this world just like everyone else. However, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you have power. You have the power of redemption. The power of the precious blood of Jesus. And that power, oh hallelujah, that power can change you. Can give you power to overcome sin and this world. Oh, we've got to be. Do you feed the 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 glory man that's within you by reading your word, by praying, by getting to prayer meetings, by by having fellowship with believers, by by listening to to to, um, to, to men preach perhaps online or reading good spiritual books? Do you do all these things, these exercises, these spiritual exercises of faith? Do you do these things so that then you have power, come the temptation, come the time to bring to it into obedience the very thoughts, the very imaginations of your mind? It's all, it all starts here. It all starts here. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And that's what I'm trying to preach to. That's what I'm trying to reach. 
Now I've got your eyes looking at me and listening to me and your ears. But you know, I'm not, I'm not actually that bothered about your eyes and ears. And I appreciate the fact that you're attentive. But what I'm more interested in is your heart listening. Is your heart opening? Are the eyes of your understanding of your heart enlightened? Because I can, I can have your attention, but I've done it myself. Oh, I, was, I didn't become a Christian until I was 16, to let you understand. And I perfected the ability to look interested. When I wasn't, I went to church and people thought I was in rapt attention of the preacher. <laughs> Are you joking? I was away scoring a goal in an FA Cup final for Liverpool in the 70s. You know, I was, I was heading the ball in, you know. I was all caught up with sport and all caught up with, with, with things that uh, were certainly not godly. And, and oh, I could look at someone and, and, and they would look at me, the preacher, and, and yet not be looking at them. Are you with me? I was there, but I wasn't there. You know, perhaps you kids do it in school. I know uh, Jane has this uh, issue with, uh, with our children uh, when at times they can just daydream. Oh, no wonder Jake's smiling. Hey, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're all doing it. I've done it. I've done it. And, and, and you know something? Uh, sometimes I speak to people. And you've maybe had this people that take two minutes to say something they could say in two seconds. And I put the phone down and I press the speaker button and I get on with other things and I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be disrespectful to them but I just know what they want to say but they've got to say it their way um, and then and then telling them about a mistake that's been made now I know the mistake that's been made but they, they're giving me it blow by blow and 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 so I do switch off I do switch off um, post office work and computer systems and and all the ins and outs of these things can get very boring indeed and if i don't if i don't find something else to do while i'm speaking to people i tend to really lose attention completely and forget who, who I'm, I'm, even, I'm even talking to i do this all the while and i don't know if it's a bad sign about i don't know um dementia for the future but i always it happens to me every every day virtually i ring someone up and because my mind's thinking about other things I forget who I'm ringing and it's ringing out and then they answer and then I'm thinking who are you <laughs> but I'll phone them and they're thinking what you know I says who am I and I have to quickly look at my phone oh I know who I'm phoning you know they take a little bit too long to, 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 to answer it's it's so easy and in church it's so easy to become distracted oh God chain his hand and foot to his cross that's where we need to be chain hand and foot to his cross not leaving not departing not moving away for even for a moment beneath the cross of Jesus that's a beautiful hymn that William loves beneath the cross of Jesus I fain would take my stand the shadow of a mighty rock within a thirsty land all oh, this need to be to be able by the Spirit of God through redemption to bring even our imaginations I warn you I warn you right now in, in with all the, the authority I can bring I've served my apprenticeship in this world to, to know this to be true you make something sinful your obsession you make something sinful that I don't know it, but God knows it. It's in your mind and you're thinking about it continually. It won't stay in your mind. It will manifest itself. If your heart is to become a jihadist, then I can promise you, you'll find a way to get over to Syria, to join them eventually. And what's frightening is there's 400 over there from the United Kingdom, more being added to all the while. It's scary. It's frightening where this world's going that's another subject but all of these things start in the heart then they start to mushroom if you feed them if you keep feeding it I was Jordana and I were visiting a, a post office down in uh, Edinburgh Road in Newcastle she was staffing it for me and I introduced her to the manager of the shop Duncan big Mohican wow massive Mohican all waxed up looks amazing 
funny, funny hairdo for a for a manager, that's for sure. But anyway, it's another story. Um, but he was just he introduced us to his dog. Oh, it's like a up here, a massive dog. He lives above it, you see. And he was just taking the dog out, massive. And then he says it's six months old. I said, what? It's going to be a horse by the time you've fed it. And he has to feed this thing huge amounts of meat and gives it, you know, bottles of chum and oh, it's bottles. It's not bottles, it's tins. <laughs> it's tins and and yeah, he just has to. And I says to him, you keep feeding that. What, what's, what's he going to be like, an elephant here if this keeps up? Six months old and the life in it and the strength of it. I don't know what kind of dog it was. Maybe a Great Dane or something like that. Um, but that's how that dog was growing. It was so well. Oh, it looked healthy. Beautiful dog. I wouldn't go and clap it. You know, I don't fancy doing that. Dogs and I don't tend to get on too well. But um, I was bit a couple of times when I was uh, just a kid. And, and I've never, never really kind of... It's like when I fell off a slide, I've never been good with height since then, and same with dogs. So if I met a dog on a slide, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be in big trouble. It'd be a nightmare, you know? I don't know what, I'd, I'd just wet myself, you know? I'd just like, oh, freeze, you know, panic attack. I wouldn't be on the slide in the first place, but, and I don't think the dog would be on the slide either, but you know, we're getting, we're getting just distracted here. But the, you, you feed it, and it grows! You feed it and it will become bigger and stronger and then it will outgrow your mind. You won't be able to contain it any longer. You won't be able to keep the monster in check. And then what will happen? The monster will control you. And this is what's happening in this world. The monster of lust, the monster of hate, the monster of war. Oh, we sell these arms to countries and then years pass by and we go, oh my goodness. We recognise that rocket that's coming towards us. <laughs> we sold them that 20 years ago. You know, and this is, this is the, we, we create the monster. We feed it. And that's obviously on a grand uh, political scale. But oh, you can put this principle very neatly, very firmly into your heart into your mind rebellion the e evil god's through his redemptive work in the lord jesus christ at the cross has delivered us from evil genesis 6 and 5 can't dwell on these verses too much for the sake of time says that every imagination of the heart of men and women noah's day was only evil continually they had fed the monster to such an extent that all human goodness, the milk of human kindness, had disappeared completely out of sight. That's when God said, enough. I'm starting again with Noah. I'm flooding this world and I'm bringing it to a halt. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, um, cleanse this world from the, um, from the, the nightmare that is, that is mankind. What makes the difference between between uh, that hellish, that awful picture of only evil continually uh, in the sight of God. What, what, what can redeem that situation? Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And what's grace? Grace is the Lord Jesus Christ's shedding of his blood at Calvary for me and for you. And that then gives us power, gives us strength, gives us, gives us the ability to even bring the thoughts and the imaginations of our hearts into captivity, unto the obedience of Christ. Just going over my sermon before I came through here, I was just sitting on the seats and I came across this wonderful, wonderful verse. This is powerful logic again. Oh, see the word of God. It's powerful. Listen to this. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. That's clever, isn't it? A good man, because he's got the grace of God in his life, delves into his good heart, because that's what he's been focusing on, the things of God. And what does he bring out of his heart? He brings out good things. Now listen to this. An evil man out of evil treasure brings forth evil things there you have it quite plain 
quite simple, quite, quite, quite powerful. You have an evil heart, you will bring out evil treasure that will cause you to do evil things. And this is, this is where the world is. This is what God has saved us from through his son. We're not, we're not bound um, by the rebellion of this world, by the evil things of this world, because we have the blood, hallelujah. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, that's cleansed us from all our sin and has given us power. Power, wonder working power. Oh, this is so, so um, powerful. Let me give you some more scriptures. Now listen carefully to these. <sighs> listen carefully to these. Here's an amazing thing. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Can you live perfectly? Uh, no, no, you can't. You're, you're going to, if I apply the Ten Commandments to your life right now, at some point you've lied, at some point you've lusted, at some point you've, you've coveted, at some point you've took God's name in vain, and so on. And go through all ten of them. At some point you've desecrated his day, at some point you've blown it. And if you've blown it as many times as I have, you won't even bother arguing. You'll just say, God, you're righteous. God, I'm guilty. So we're all, in the eyes of the law, we're all doomed. The Ten Commandments nail us left, right and centre. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Oh, this is wonderful. But, but, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. What's this righteousness of God? What are you talking about, Paul? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, whatever he's talking about, was watched, was seen, was predicted, was noticed by the law, by the prophets, we're building up to it, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. We blew it. We've made a mess of things over and over, but he hasn't. And we're hiding in him. We're finding refuge in him. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross I cling naked I come to thee for dress helpless I look to thee for grace foul I to the fountain fly wash me saviour or I die it's powerful that sensible logic that's on fire Amazing, Lord Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all, this righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, it's, a, it's unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Do you believe? How do you believe? Well, I didn't believe before. I don't know what changed. I'll tell you what changed. God gave you the faith to believe. Hallelujah. God gave you the gift back to redemption Jesus died to redeem me to give me a gift what was the gift the gift of faith to believe that what Jesus did for me at Calvary hallelujah was all for me and because he loved me and he gave himself for me for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God oh you're right there oh we're back to that again being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. See these words, these words are lovely, they're nice, they're well thought out, nice structure. He's quite clever, Paul. He's, he's, he's switched on, he knows his stuff. But you know when, when they suddenly come alive, when they jump right out the page, when you suddenly say, hold on a minute, that's me he's talking about. I've experienced that. I'm justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus how have you changed how have you stopped swearing how have you how have you how have you even since you've made a profession of faith have you seen there's been a change your desires have changed because the spirit is working in your life redemption is giving you a power to overcome sin to not to not be um, a rebel against God but now to rebel against this world and Satan and all he stands for God's channeling the energies you had before that you were you were you were sinning with 
And now you're finding that the grace of God through reading the word is making you strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And redemption is giving you power. Oh, listen to this. It's all here. It's all here. It's all here. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. There's another technical word I'll give you meaning to in a minute. Through faith um, in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Oh, it's wonderful. It is wonderful what God has done. Let's very, very briefly move on to the, the D, which is the D for death. Redemption's taking you from rebellion, from evil, and from death. And this is where we come to Christ, the Passover lamb. That amazing picture that man painted. I mean, I couldn't even begin to do what he did. But then he turns it upside down and it's another picture. And you think, well, the gifts that some people have are quite, uh, are quite amazing. And then they're seen and they're most beautiful when they're used for his glory, aren't they? But death, very briefly, Exodus 12. They're coming to that point where they were to leave Egypt and, and the Passover lamb um, was, was to be the means by which a God would save his people Israel from the angel of death now, I wished I would be allowed to have a red paintbrush but Liz would have a she'd lay a canary but just to demonstrate it to you because my impression uh, from listening to others and from uh, and from and from reading also was that the news came from Moses right God's so angry with Egypt bearing in mind we're in Egypt we're in this world this world is rebelling this world is evil this world is heading to death and not just death it's heading to the second death the ultimate death uh, spiritually um, so we're in we're in Egypt and Moses comes and he says right this is the only way we're not gonna get die along with the Egyptians you need to take a lamb needs to be without blemish needs to be a perfect lamb and you need to sacrifice it and take its blood and you need to smear it let's say this is the the door here you need to smear it get it really now it couldn't be just a tiny speck of blood because you're dealing with life and death here this is a this wasn't a matter of of um of um of, of something that if, oh, if we don't put enough on it doesn't really matter now I have a vested interest in this being in this blood being applied properly why because I'm a firstborn right I'm the oldest in my family if Joshua was here he'd have a vested interest as well the firstborn were all under threat all under the judgment of God if you're the first Taylor you're in trouble if this blood doesn't get applied properly if you're the firstborn then then you, you've got to make sure this blood is applied and it is coated on. It's splashed on. Get it nice and thick so that the angel of death will not miss it. One down the doorpost there. More down the doorpost here. And then across the lintel, which was the, 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 the roof of the door, if you like. The part that connected the two beams to make the door. Get it all along there as well. Nice and red. Get the blood. I don't know how much blood is in a lamb. I know the blood is, is um, be a fair amount of it. Get it clear, get it obvious, so that when the angel of death passes over, as it lifts its sword of judgment to bring death, it sees the blood. The blood of Jesus is for us, that's good, but that's not the primary reason it was for. It's for God to see, so that his judgment passes over. And this is why Jesus, all these lambs that were sacrificed for this purpose, Jesus is referred to as the lamb without blemish he was the perfect lamb and you know what I didn't realize perhaps everyone else did and I didn't that may well be the case I didn't realize when Jesus rode into Jerusalem if that wasn't the day it certainly was just about the day of selecting the lamb do you see the topology that you see the parallel here you've got the you've got Jesus riding into Jerusalem everyone's saying Hosanna the son of David and they're laying palms down and they're waving their branches and they're all celebrating what that Jesus has arrived it's Palm Sunday by the way this is what this is what them um, Christendom celebrate on their Palm Sunday is the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem and what I didn't realize was that's the day and it might have been the following day but certainly it was the day or the very next day 
when they were required as the tenth day of the first month to choose a lamb. So as they're choosing the lamb, the supreme lamb appears in Jerusalem. And he's declaring to all, um, or others are declaring, as, as John the Baptist did, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And as Jesus walks into, or rides into Jerusalem upon that ass, great, great picture of humility, as his whole life was, extraordinary picture of humility, if that was the Sunday... And everyone was celebrating, Hosanna, waving their palms, all saying victory and, and glory, and, 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 and they're all rejoicing at, at Jesus' arrival. Five days later, crucify him, crucify him. Five days. I mean, I know, I know, I know football managers sometimes have a, a short life expectancy, but that's extraordinary, isn't it? To go from the whole city, it says, move to celebrate the arrival of Jesus, the triumphant Jesus, the hero, to, to five days later, let Barabbas go. We'll keep Jesus and we'll crucify him and we'll torture him. But as crazy and as outrageous and as wrong and as terrible as that is, it was all planned. God had it all in control because the Passover lamb had to go through a death a perfect spotless unblemished lamb he had to die that we might be able to overcome death because his redemptive work he redeemed us he redeemed us and redeemed yes I am by the blood of the Lamb Jesus Christ has done it all for me I know it's beautiful to, 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 to consider what he's done for us at Calvary um, once I was lost I had nowhere to go my life was just a lonely round of sin then Jesus said to me by my bloodshed on the tree I paid the price I bought you back bought you back purchased you back you're mine oh what a friend hallelujah do you see the Passover lamb? What the Lord Jesus has done, all the types of the Old Testament fulfilled in him, fulfilled in what he did at Calvary. Oh, the power of it, the power of it, the beauty of it. It's beautiful, it's just sensational. And as Jesus died upon that cross, shed his blood, the precious blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, that blood then gives us power power over rebellion power over evil power over death even death where is thy sting grave where is thy victory oh your body will die but you know what the real you will go on the real you is defiant the real you has eternal life the real you will never die it will live forever with him and forever with the Lord. Amen. So let it be. This is the power of this tremendous picture of the Passover lamb, of Christ's redemptive work. Oh, there was a wee boy, I'll just say this in closing, who um, built the most beautiful boat. He was a real expert at, at, at making boats. And this was the best creation of his that he'd ever put together. And he took it with great joy, skipping to the water side where its sail soon caught the wind and he watched it with great pride as it, as, it, as it sailed off. But then to his horror, it went much further than he expected. Before he knew it, it was out of his reach and then out of his sight. The boy went home, distraught, all that work, only for it to, to sail off into the distance. And to lose his precious creation. The next day, well, I think it was a two or three days thereafter, he walking through his his, um, his village, and in the toy shop, he noticed a boat. He looked a bit closer. He says, "That's that's my boat." He looked he looked face against the the glass. He could see the detail that he put into it. It definitely was his. There's no doubt about it. He ran into the shopkeeper. That's my boat. I want my boat back. The shopkeeper says, oh, no, 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 no. That's my boat. 
and I'm selling it. You need to pay for it, young man. The wee boy protests, but the shopkeeper's having none of it. The wee boy runs away, goes home, empties every piggy bank, goes down behind all the couches in the house. He scrapes together just enough. He runs back to the shopkeeper and he gives him the money that he's managed to bring together to buy the boat. You know, the boat's more precious to him now than ever before because the boy didn't just create the boat. He bought the boat as well. Have you any idea? Have you any idea how precious you are to God? It's one thing he made you. It's another thing, or it's a much greater thing, <coughs> that he's bought you. Bought you with the blood of his son. Purchased your salvation. Paid the ransom money. That's a scriptural principle in the word of God as well. Oh, may we rejoice in the, the beautiful redemptive work I'm redeemed hallelujah how I love to proclaim it oh it's a wonderful song uh, in, this, in the revelations one of the great songs that you'll hear is the song of the redeemed it will boom out there'll be millions joining in that great song and the rejoicing of God's people will be so great will be so wonderful because this redemption that he's given us Oh, it, it has saved us from rebellion. It's bought us from evil. It's purchased us from death. And all glory be unto God. It's only his, Him. Entirely Him. Entirely. There's, it ha the only thing that stops us from being consumed, said the Israelites, is the blood. The blood. That's all that's between us and Him. And His wrath. And His hot displeasure against us. Now he sees the blood of Jesus, he realizes, God says, ah, oh, they're one of those who I've chosen before the foundation of the world, whom my son has took the punishment for. I'll not judge them. I'll not, I'll not pour out my wrath against them. They won't go to hell. They'll be trophies of grace, vessels of mercy for eternity. Oh, hallelujah. What a savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.